Well, good afternoon to all of you. Since we have a German professor here, so we are very glad that we are starting right on dot. Of course, uh, in Germany, they won't say this. <laughs> right? uh, oh, and there, there it goes. Um, so I'm extremely glad to uh, introduce to you Professor Andreas, Professor Dr. Andreas Breitstar. Uh, Andreas Deisler is a professor of mechanical engineering at the Technical University of Darmstadt. He received his master's in physics from the University, University of Heidelberg in 1988 and a PhD in physical chemistry from the same university in 1995. He completed his undergraduate studies in physics at the University, University Kiel and University Heidelberg. Andreas Deisler was awarded habilitation in combustion technology in 2002. He now heads the Institute for Reactive Flows and Diagnostics. The Institute for Reactive Flows and Diagnostics is embedded in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the um, Technische University Darmstadt. The, uh, it, is, it is part of the Excellence Cluster Smart Interfaces uh, and was founded in June 2008. He further received habilitation in mechanical engineering from Technical University Darmstadt, Germany. He is the winner of um, Wilhelm Gottfried Leibniz Award, uh, received from German Research Foundation, DFG, during the year 2014. He has published more than 140 peer-reviewed scientific uh, journals and books, and more than 60 research publications worldwide. Andreas Dreitzler has made a large number of substantial experimental contributions to the quantitative characterization of turbulent combustion processes. These include the world's first measurements of hydrocarbon concentrations and temperatures in flames, which could only be achieved through the ingenious use of nonlinear optical effects, as well as the first quantitative imaging measurements of formaldehyde formation in self-igniting combustion engines and turbulent transport in flames with the help of laser-induced fluorescence and high-speed cameras. Most recently, Dreisler designed novel experiments to track the time, place, behavior of three-dimensional turbulent flows. Breitzler's measuring methods and results are being used all over the world to improve models of combustion. After he completed his physics degree, the foundations for, the foundations for his future career were laid while writing his doctor, doctorate with Jürgen Wolfram in Heidelberg. He spent a short period in technology consulting before joining the staff of the University of Stuttgart and then the Technical University of Darmstadt where since 2008, he has held a new professorship, Reactive Flows and Diagnostics, in the Excellence Cluster Smart Interfaces. To be honest with you, you don't get a better person. Mm. Professor Dyson. Okay. Well, thank you, Satya, for these kind words. Uh, hopefully, uh, you find afterwards, uh, afterwards the same as he said. So it's an honor to be here, first time for me in India to speak to such a crowd of people working on combustion. Uh, well, I guess most of you are not really familiar to where I come from. That's maybe I should start my lecture uh, before we go into uh, more scientific parts to uh, show where I am. So what you fi find here is the map of uh, uh, Europe. Actually, this little piece here, uh, that is Germany, here it's a magnified. And uh, the city of Darmstadt actually is somewhere located in the southern part, uh, somewhere here. Well, it's a, compared to your stand, as I would say, it's a very small city. It's a typically sized German city with 150,000 people living there. Uh, well, special is that we have something around uh, 40,000 students in more than 30 uh, research institutions, with TU Darmstadt being the largest. Uh, that's actually an old school uh, for technical schools, universities in Germany, uh, date back uh, several hundred years. However, in uh, Darmstadt, the technical universities, they have been founded 150 years ago or so. Well, we are a medium-sized university having something like 25,000 students with only uh, less than 300 professors. And that's maybe special, at least to most uh, uh, cultures worldwide, um, because normally the ratio between professors and students is much better. It's uh, roughly 100 to 1. And that's actually where I'm, uh, well, uh, used to speak to people with classes more than 500 people, yeah, because otherwise you can't organize it. All right, um, we have 
roughly 50% in engineering and 35% uh, in natural science. And one of the profile areas of the university actually is thermofluidics, including energy conversion. And that is where I'm hosted in, and that is, uh, let's say, my specialty in combustion. And um, when Satya asked me to give these five uh, lectures, each one and a half hours, um, well, I thought it's good to talk about uh, my area in a, in a certain perspective, in a larger perspective, talking about experiments in turbulent combustion. All right? So uh, there will be only very few equations uh, when we come to the different uh, diagnostic techniques, all of them laser-based. Um, but I try to make it uh, as visual as possible that you can easily follow, even though if you're not working in the experimental field. So maybe to start with, uh, whom of you is working experimentally? Maybe you lift your hands. Oh, that's not bad. It's at least the half, right? And the others are working numerically and theoretically. That's correct. All right. <laughs> okay. So I guess um, when we when we start to talk about combustion. Here, at least in this audio, uh, auditorium, we do not need really a lot of motivation why we should do that. Um, it's quite clear that we have to work on improved combustion technology because of the uh, importance uh, in its energy conversion processes. And so this, although it's an old chart, it still holds true. 80% of energy conversion is done by uh, combustion of so far fossil fuels. From the last week's conference in Paris, of course, we know we have to change that, and uh, that's quite clear. However, that is the current situation, and we have to do something about it. Uh, because of global warming, and maybe as well your flood last week here, partly might be caused by changes in the weather. I don't know whether it's really such a uh, special event here. However, we see that globally uh, for um, quite clearly, as you for example, see here the uh, average temperatures, uh, annually average temperatures going up all the time. So limited resources is clear again. And of course, pollutant emissions is a big issue as well. In Europe, that is primarily about uh, uh, soot and particles uh, being a big topic. And maybe uh, so far special for Germany, but I think after the, uh, the, the Paris conference, will be important as well for other parts of Europe and the world, system flexibility. flexibility. That is something we have to work heavily on if you think about the energy transition. Yeah? If you think how to change how you generate power and use, for example, wind and solar power, and then use combustion systems to compensate for fluctuations. So system flexibility is one of the uh, primary objectives of, of the next uh, um, uh, types of gas turbines, for example. So if you want to meet these challenges, that's quite clear, you have to gain a substantial fundamental understanding of what's going on in the combustion process. And I guess all of you know that, um, that combustion, of course, is in its, in its uh, uh, heart uh, coupled process between transport and chemical kinetics, which are, depend on each other in a nonlinear way. This is why it's scientifically so challenging and interesting, and uh, from a technology point of view, uh, still so, so difficult to improve it. Of course, there are other uh, uh, things taking place, like phase change, heat transfer, emissions, and so on. But in its, its, in its heart, it's really the coupling between transport and chemical kinetics. And if you want to improve these kind of systems, we have to gain uh, the insights into what's going on in physical and chemical um, uh, details. If you look back, how combustion uh, systems have been improved in the past, so it was by trial and error, build and test. That's maybe uh, the most successive, uh, success, successful way to build the, uh, technology. However, if you come to an end, and that is something which is true for combustion technology, you do need something else, which is quite clearly numerical simulation. And I put this slide up because now, the role of experiments is a completely different one. What you need is, from these experiments, devoted to, to support uh, modeling and numerical combustion, is to gain a fundamental understanding which is required to build up models. That's one thing. And the other is, you have to come up with comprehensive data which are suitable for validation purposes. And that is the area I'm working in. Very closely related, not only in Darmstadt, but worldwide, 
So the data we are and the kind of experiments we're conducting, we're doing that in close relationship with people uh, on the numer numerical side. However, there is as well uh, an arrow back to the experiments because, uh, of course, you can use numerical simulation, for example, to lay out, design certain nozzles with certain characteristics you're wishing or aiming for. Or you might use that as well for analyzing systematic errors, uh, which is very difficult to do purely experimentally. However, if you think you have a reliable numerical tool, of course, you can uh, use that for design purposes. However, all the, what is feasible right now, to my understanding, is uh, not deterministic. So you, what you can do by numerical simulation is only to uh, uh, yeah, represent trends. If you make subtle changes in your geometry or in your, in your flow system, um, you can predict what's going on. Uh, but building completely a combustor only by numerical simulation is not yet feasible. However, you can think of as well using reduced simulation tools for control purposes. That is as well something for the future I think will uh, have growing importance. Uh, all of this became possible uh, mainly because of uh, tools on the hard and software side, and especially for my uh, piece of work that is true for lasers and detectors that became available over the last, let's say, 20 years. Uh, without them, it would not have been even feasible to do it. So you can expect now in the next seven hours or so uh, some information about, as I said, primarily experiments and experiments which are, uh, should, should promote an understanding of um, the turbulent combustion processes uh, and provide validation data which are urgently needed. And this is a tough business because, uh, of course, you have to fulfill certain requirements coming from the numerical simulation. For example, and we'll talk about that later, for example, like boundary and inflow conditions. Building up an experiment where you exactly or as good know what is going on in the, in the boundaries is a completely different experiment compared to one where you just build something and show a phenomenon. Yeah? OK, so um, when I selected some topics for these lectures, I would like to start for today with some benchmark flames to show up, uh, at least from my perspective, how it should be done. And then we talk about how you measure important quantities parameters. That will be flow field, uh, velocimetry, and I picked up from the scalar field, of course, Many things should be measured. I pick up here primarily thermometry, although I touch as well species concentration measurements and visualization things. Uh, all uh, over the place, I will have here uh, many, many examples to, to show what's going on. However, uh, I have then to, towards the end as well a selected application example that I think is um, important and hasn't gained too much attention so far, which is flame wall interactions. Uh, that has been uh, looked at and tackled primarily numerically. However, we do this now experimentally. Okay, so just the repeating what I've just said, what we need is uh, good experimental, reliable experimental information from which we can build models. And in the end, once we have that, uh, validate uh, how these different models interact with each other uh, to, to have something which is, as I said, not really deterministic, but as good, uh, matching the physics and chemistry as good as possible um, to be reliable, even though if you have only a spare set of experiments. And so I will restrict myself to gaseous flames. And because that's my specialty, um, I will talk uh, about laser-based diagnostics only. All right. So let's get started. What do you need? If you want to build up a benchmark configuration um, and perform laser-based diagnostics, of course, you have to provide an optical access, um, uh, which is not easy, as you will see, when you go, let's say, for enclosed combustion. You have to have a good knowledge about the inflow and boundary conditions. And that is not an easy task, even for simple flames, even for canonical configurations. And as a third um, bullet point here, um, you need to have or look into flame sequences. Making up a single experiment, let's say, with one Reynolds number, one equivalence ratio, uh, one set of parameters, that is useless. What you need to look at is how things are changing once you're changing certain inflow and boundary conditions. OK. Well, um, first of all, because uh, turbulent combustion is primarily a thing about flow, you have to know uh, as good and detailed knowledge about uh, the, the flow field itself. We'll come to uh, the needs later on. 
And of course, after that, once you have a certain understanding of the turbulence uh, uh, underlying the uh, combustion process, uh, you have to measure scalars. And that means you have to uh, measure uh, species con concentrations and temperature as the most important quantities. And here I will concentrate primarily on thermometry with the application example, once again, flame wall interactions. Let's have a closer look into the optical requirements. Well, typically what you like to have are at least uh, or three optical excesses to get the laser in, get the laser out, and very often perpendicular to that because of the spatial resolution requirements and, and entrance for the detection. Then, um, especially when you're interested in looking into more complex systems, you're very often as well aiming for more complex uh, nozzles than just a jet pipe or whatever. Um, you should take care that the nozzle exit is somehow accessible and um, such that you can measure radial profiles and by experience already if you get as close as one millimeter you're good. Very often that is not so easy to, to attain but that's at least um, a wish that we have. Um, however, very often fluid uh, mechanics takes place inside the nozzle and everything that comes out is too late if you measure it there, which means you should try if you have a complex geometry to measure inside this nozzle, which is not easy uh, because of uh, maybe complex geometries, because of ceilings, uh, whatever it is, but that hasn't been done so far too often. And if you go for more complex systems, that is something you should aim for. Of course, um, you need some protection of your system, especially when you're working in the open atmosphere. When you open the door, nothing should happen. And uh, that's trivial, but it's not easy to achieve in the end. And you need a decoupling of the exhaust system. Well, then very often you have to um, fulfill a requirement for the fuel because, uh, because of uh, spectroscopic requirements or restrictions. For example, if you want to understand or uh, do research in gasoline engines, for example, you cannot use simple gasoline because of um, the problems you would have uh, with uh, interferences uh, coming from uh, the spectroscopic properties. And that's why you have to come up with a surrogate fuel. Uh, and depending on the requirements, you should uh, have here a good selection, um, which is n not a universal uh, surrogate you can choose. It depends really on uh, the question you want to answer. Okay, once you have all these requirements fulfilled, uh, you have to know or measure the inflow conditions. In simple pipe flows, you might know that. However, in more complex systems, you don't, and that's why you have to measure uh, them as good as possible. You need well-defined boundary conditions, and that over days and weeks and months. Yeah? And that's not easy um, to fulfill because of many reasons. However, very often you have to come back to your experiment or you have to do one uh, parameter measurement after the next, and for that, uh, you have to make sure that the system runs as the days before. And that needs a lot of effort in the infrastructure of your lab. Um, you need flame sequences, meaning that you need these parametric variations, uh, such as variation of fuel composition, Reynolds number as well, if you have pressure geometry. In the end, what you're after, you want to identify sensitivities. Yeah? What happens if you change something? That is something, this trend is, is uh, what you need in the end as well for um, the um, design process of, of these combustors. And uh, that is as well something that can be fulfilled by numerical simulation as well. Um, and if you already fulfill or have a matching of the sensitivities and the experiments in the numerical simulation, that already is a, is a, a good thing if you have that. Very often it doesn't match. Well, to uh, come up with a, let's say, a research plan to fulfill these uh, ideas, we have built over the years uh, a number of benchmark configurations following the idea going from simple to complex. And simple is something where you have, of, of course, turbulence included, but atmospheric flames for many reasons. One is the optical excess, like turbulent opposed jets, and that will be one example. Like uh, jet flames, for example, with fuel certification, um, where you can look as well for flame propagation after ignition. For example, you have a, a, a flow coming out, you ignite somewhere, and then the flame propagates upstream. Uh, the next level of complexity would be stay atmospheric, but uh, have a more complex flow field. Um, for example, by having uh, a bluff body, that you have a recirculation zone, or by adding swirl. 
Or you can go in a different di direction in terms of complexity, going uh, into low temperature chemistry responsible for auto ignition under turbulent conditions that hasn't been done so often. And uh, what we have seen in the past in the experiments is rather limited. We try to overcome that with a new auto ignition uh, device. Um, going in a direction of multi-phase combustion is uh, here in our case looking for supercritical droplets because of high pressures. Um, or having a uh, multi-phase flow in the sense that we add a wall to a gaseous flame, that we have a flame burning close uh, with heat losses um, to this wall. Uh, then the next level of complexity is to add um, pressure. Of course, keep uh, the complex geometry from a swirled flame. Typically, in these uh, devices, we don't have any jet flames um, to have the systems compact. However, you need an enclosure. Uh, and uh, finally going to transparent engines where you have, in addition, intermittency. Just recently we started as well solid fuel combustion, uh, coal combustion, which is then not added here because we just started recently and I don't have a nice view graph of that. Okay, as I said, the idea is going from simple to complex because uh, at the simple configurations in the upper left, you will uh, gain more information than that will, will be available in this uh, lower right uh, of this view graph. So uh, these are the three examples uh, of benchmark flames I will discuss. Turbulent post jet, swirled bluff body stabilized flame, then enclosed flame, and finally, as an example for intermittent combustion, the transient uh, combustion um, uh, IC engine, auto engine combustion. So let's get started with example number one, uh, which is quite still quite popular, uh, which is the opposed jet configuration. So most of you doing a simulation, of course, know that being laminar from the 1D calculations. However, the idea was here to have something, a model system that mimics certain situations in a gas turbine, where you have opposing flows that interact with each other, uh, giving the chemistry only little time to reach its uh, equilibrium or not reaching its equilibrium. So meaning turbulence chemistry interactions can be easily studied in this device. And you see here a cross section through this uh, a turbulent post jet uh, system, we have two opposing nozzles, contoured nozzles, to provide at the exit here and here something like a top hat profile. Um, well, the turbulence intensity can be enhanced by having turbulence grids over here, for example, with this geometry, with a certain solidity, uh, with the simple configurations, you can get something like a turbulence level of 10%. However, people at Imperial College have developed a, a fractal grid and they can enhance it up to 30%. Yeah? So we can do something about it. Um, well, there is a co-flow at here. This is surrounding the nozzles to prevent that you have any ambient air mixing in. And um, of course, then you have here, uh, for example, from the top, the air, and from the bottom, the fuel. They mix. You typically take the same momentum. Then they, turbined, uh, they, they, they mix over here. And if you ignite, you would find a flame burning in this uh, horizontal stagnation plane located in, a, in the middle of the two jets if you have the same momentum as I just said. And for long-term operation uh, and stability, you have to protect the system of getting it somehow overheated and that's why it needs water cooling. And uh, that is what I meant when I said you have to make sure that the, the flame is operating each day like the day before. And that is one simple way to check that. Uh, if you increase the momentum of these two streams, uh, the residence time here at the stagnation point will be too short that the chemistry uh, provides sufficient heat for igniting the next fresh gases. And if you stay within, let's say, 2% two, two of the extinction limit for a certain, let's say, fuel composition, I would say that is reproducible. That is something, by my experience, is something you can get and gain, but um, getting uh, something like only 10% or 20% reproducibility of the extinction limits would not be sufficient. Okay, and in this special case, we were able to send through a laser uh, at this uh, symmetry axis to have then here uh, crossing uh, with this 1D probe volume that we have looked at, crossing the flame front perpendicularly. And so in this case, we have uh, varied the fuel and the Reynolds number from stable to extinction, um, showing uh, here this uh, kind of flame sequence where you see here the Reynolds number and here uh, b flames that burn non premixed uh, This is a mixture which is out of the flammability limits against air and burning therefore non premixed uh, However, by that uh, we still avoid soot. And soot is something in spectroscopy you wouldn't like. 
Yeah, that is, it's of course real, but um, uh, it's prohibitive then, uh, for example, to, to perform Raman experiments for, for species concentration measurements once you have suit. And you see, um, um, well, on the right-hand side, other configurations that have been operated in premixed mode. Okay, so you have a broad flexibility with this kind of system. However, what you see as well, the Reynolds numbers are restricted to small values. And that is kind of the problem uh, of these kind of systems. However, if you would uh, go further in Reynolds number, you would end up with extinction. And that is why uh, some people say, okay, that's a, it's a nice um, configuration to start with, but the, the high turbulence levels you're not achieving. And let's take this uh, configuration here as a, uh, an example where you're close to the extinction limit and look at the turbulence Reynolds number, that is only in the order of 90. And that is something you can still achieve with DNS these days. And so maybe it's questionable whether you should perform experiments like that still. However, I think um, if, you, if you would change the turbulence grid, it would be uh, uh, achievable to, to get higher numbers here as well. What is as well interesting is, uh, well, uh, you have uh, short residence times in the mixing layers, meaning that you avoid suit, which is good. Uh, you have uh, integral length scales here in that case, measured at the nozzle exit, which can be changed by the turbines grid. You have a certain way uh, or range where you can vary it. And very important as well is, if you look at the length scales, the Kolmogorov and Bachelor length scales for the flow and the scalars, you find uh, something in the order of uh, uh, 200 microns, which is uh, a value that we can still resolve with uh, laser diagnostics, meaning that we have the full resolution, which is uh, for some aspects important. And you see here now a time averaged uh, flame luminosity on the left hand side, however, uh, it doesn't look turbulent. If you look with high speed or not moderate speed, 500 hertz, here you see that actually the flame is turbulent, yeah, as expected. <coughs> Um, as I said, the special feature is that you can go into extinction. If you now operate the system close to extinction, you find here in chemiluminescence imaging, this is with an angle of 15 degrees from below, maybe I should start it again, you find uh, how the flame actually extinguishes. Um, you have here waves of higher reactivity, some holes, if they're off-center, doesn't matter. However, if you have extinction locally, at the stagnation point, it grows and then finally it guides into global extinction. Okay, important to look at these uh, basic cases, however, not sufficient. We have to skip, uh, go a step further, and that's why uh, I want to present as the next uh, swirling lean premix flames, which are, of course, relevant for understanding gas turbine combustion, where you have not only complex chemistry, as already seen in the uh, opposed jet flame, but as well a complex flow field. Um, and so we have decided to look into a nozzle uh, for quite some years now, uh, which is closer to practical applications, um, and especially now as well look, looking into premixed flames because of their potential of low NOx, and um, came up with the system shown here. That is the system where you have an annular slot, which is surrounding a central bluff body. The bluff body can be water-cooled if, if wished, and you have here in the plenum uh, a, com a perfect mixture between your fuel, typically that's methane or natural gas, and air. And uh, well, here you have a an, an radial swirl assembly that can be changed um, as to be uh, seen at the next view graph. However, it consists of um, uh, radial and tangential inflows, and thereby you create a swirl. In addition to the bluff body, you have a strong recirculation uh, pointing backwards and uh, an inner recirculation somewhere here, and you have as well an outer recirculation as well uh, contributing to the flame stabilization. And by changing the mass flow rates, you can change the Reynolds number, and the swirl number can be changed because it's a movable block design, and that is shown here, uh, cross-section through the swirler, uh, where you have here um, movable parts that are shown in dark gray and fixed parts that is light gray, and then by, by twisting them, you can interchange the geometric swirl number between zero and two, and that's quite interesting because thereby the effect of swirl can be used as well to look into flame dynamics, for example, like flashback. I, I think Tim uh, talked to you about it. We performed experiments where you can trigger uh, flashback for a given equivalence ratio by twisting this block uh, and driving the flame into a flashback. Again, it's important to look into flame sequences, and here 
you see a, a variation of the uh, Reynolds number from 10 to 40,000. Accordingly, of course, the thermal power is changing. Uh, what is as well interesting here, well, this was done for a fixed swirl number where we have had stable operation. Yeah? And this is something like a, um, sufficiently far from a flashback. Flashback would occur, for example, uh, for this case here, for this lean case, possibly the swirl number of around one. Um, if you look into these premix flames, of course, it's important to classify them. And using this regime diagram, I think most of you are familiar with that, is plotting the normalized velocity fluctuations over the uh, normalized turbine length scale. And uh, gas turbine combustion is believed to be somewhere here, although no one really measured in a gas turbine combustor. So that's all, everything about that is, is just speculation here. Yeah? Uh, as, as well, that uh, we do not know exactly how those flames uh, in their structure look like there. Yeah? We have, this still an open question. Uh, we should measure flame structures experimentally with very high resolution to find out uh, uh, whether that is really true that we have a crossover from thin reaction zones to broken reaction zones. Yeah? However, in, in the case we are looking at, uh, at Reynolds 10,000, that is uh, for sure a laminar structure still uh, persistent and uh, even uh, for the uh, Reynolds number of 40,000, we are still in this regime of the thin reaction zones where uh, the heat release zone is, is like in a laminar flame. Okay, uh, the flame is not very spectacular. It's as well not very noisy. A flame, this is a time average photograph, uh, which is anchored here at the top of this uh, um, bluff body. However, maybe more interesting and more exciting, although you have seen, I think, something about it this morning, um, is look into the transition of flashback. Uh, that is, of course, a very important issue that you need to avoid in any application. And there are two ways in this configuration how to do that. Starting from a stable flame, which is now uh, anchored at this extended bluff body. Yeah, we extended this bluff body simply due to the reason that the transition from stable to flashback is not so sudden. Yeah, we wanted to have something in between, a transition stage in between, as you will see in a second, where the flame precesses. And that can be done um, easily if you move, uh, move the bluff body out and thereby have a different, uh, let's say, flow and pressure field. And you can, uh, if you start from a stable configuration, you can crank up the swirl number and thereby drive the flame into the flashback. Or you start with a, a fixed swirl number close, sufficiently close to the stability limit and then make simply the flame faster. If you come from the lean end, you just make it slightly richer, and thereby the laminar flame speed and then turbulent flame speed will increase, and then you can drive the system into flashback. And this is shown here. We have uh, by this, uh, of course, now it's an academic uh, configuration with this extended bluff body. However, by that trick, we were able to have now three stages of operation. One is stably, and is uh, somehow stabilized, difficult to see this in this projection, at the top of the, at the rim of the bluff body. Um, if you uh, go to this intermediate or meter-stable uh, state, then you observe a precessing of the flame, where the flame is not anchored at the rim anymore. It goes to the side and uh, spins around, and uh, eventually uh, starts to go from this precessing state into a flashback, and uh, after a flashback, the system or the flame stabilizes at the, at the swirler. And uh, you will see here only hot exhaust gases coming out of the um, uh, annular gap. And you will hear a, a loud sound. Then you have as well thermoacoustics. Let's have a look into that. Um, if you look with high speed um, diagnostics into it, uh, maybe you take this right one here, uh, taking with 10 kilohertz or something, the bluff body is here. And you see here the spinning flame, and there's always a leading tip like that one coming around now. And now, uh, for whatever reasons, and uh, Tim talked about baroclinic talk this morning, um, uh, the system decides to move very fastly upstream, and then after a few more milliseconds, it will stabilize inside the novel, and in a practical ap application, that would be game over. You have to avoid that. All right, if you look from, from the top, uh, just using your high-speed camera, maybe not directly, but better use a mirror. If you, if you damage something, uh, you nicely see the spinning state of that. Yeah? Quite interesting and uh, I think as well quite, quite beautiful. However, 
Um, interesting, of course, as well, thermoacoustic, nothing I'm specialized in, but uh, of course, for lean premix combustion, it is important. And here you see three snapshots out of a cycle that takes something like uh, 7.5 milliseconds, uh, where you see that uh, linked with this sound you hear uh, uh, is the heat release, where you have in between almost no heat release. We're looking in into the annular slot again from the top, uh, where almost no heat releases, and then it comes back, and because of that, you hear this acoustic uh, wave. Going back to the transition to flashback, of course, uh, it's experimentally quite ambitious to measure that. First of all, you need an optical access. I show that because that is a good uh, example for, man, we, we, need, we need into complex systems, we have to look into these models because everything happens inside there. And so uh, the bluff body, which was uh, either made of steel or made of glass, both uh, uh, variants we had, is surrounded now by a nozzle which is made from quartz, such that we were able to shoot in our lasers, to measure flow fields, to measure chemiluminescence imaging, to measure OH distributions, all techniques I'm going to talk about a bit later for those who are not really familiar with that. And if you do that now with high speed, and he's shown only every tenth image, um, you see actually this leading tip, um, uh, which is suddenly going from a spinning state in an upstream movement. And that is something, uh, of course, which is difficult to understand. It's a complex problem. And that's why um, uh, chemiluminescence imaging is only visualizing, but you can't understand anything from that because you need more parameters. And uh, that was the reason that we performed at high speed uh, this was 10 kilohertz OH PLIF imaging that is uh, shown over here in red from where we deduced where the flame front is actually located. And then we measured two components of the flow field. We wished to have three components, but that turned out to be very difficult because of reflections. So we stayed in that experiment with a sheet uh, of PIV, a technique I'm talking about maybe to tomorrow, maybe today, I'm not sure, uh, going uh, from right to left, hitting then the bluff body. Uh, and, of course, causing a lot of reflections. However, if you did this carefully and with 2C PIV, if this is your bluff body, like that, and you hit it slightly off-center, then the reflections can be minimized. And you can go as close as maybe 300 microns to the wall, such that you can see here, uh, in this area, actually some uh, recirculation. There's the flow. Although you have a, an uh, upstream movement here, in this area, just ahead of the flame front, uh, you actually find this um, recirculation or down, uh, up, up, upstream velocity. And to convince you, this is a bit blurred here because of the projection, what you see here is a raw image of uh, particles from PIV. And if I run this movie, you see here the particles are um, removed. I'll talk about this in a second. However, if you follow these particles, they actually go upstream. That's not an, uh, this is not an artifact from the experiments. You really see this in the raw images that you have this um, uh, upstream movement of these particles, for example. Yeah, they, they go in the wrong direction. And here, simply, uh, this was uh, a seeding material for the PIV, for those who know what PIV is, um, is oil, and that's why it evaporates, and thereby you can uh, visualize the flame front. However, after post-processing to the right-hand side, I can go click here through uh, flame by flame. Um, you see here this recirculation is always attached to this um, to this leading edge. Yeah, and uh, because of that, of course, you can now try to come up with some um, yeah, yeah aim to understand that. Just a second, and baroclinic talk, as you heard this morning, might be one reason that uh, contributes to this flashback. Although, as well, this flashback is special because you're in a boundary layer in addition. You have a question, yes, please. Say it again. How did I make it? How do you make this region is having flame, flame front region? How yeah. do you mark out that? Oh, okay. We have two ways to mark the flame front. One is uh, by the evaporating drop, uh, and the other one is uh, using OH simultaneously or quasi simultaneously, uh, which gives um, a very similar estimate of the flame front. Maybe OH distribution is a better one, and you do that um, by exciting the OH radical, which is produced in the in the flame front. Yeah. Okay. Answered? All right. Because um, there might be, uh, it would be, of course, much better, let's take this word, if you would have even more parameters. And so we as well try to measure simultaneously the pressure. 
And so that means uh, um, in this area of the bluff body, you would like to have, of course, the complete pressure field. That's something you can't measure easily. So we decided at least to have a single hole. We as well have equipped bluff bodies with up to three holes, but here's only shown one. Uh, at this location to measure now simultaneously during the flashback as well the pressure trace because there might be an adverse pressure gradient giving rise to the flashback yeah if you now have let's say two pressure ports these two fingers and the flame comes down then you would wish to see or one that is hypothesis that you have a higher pressure downstream such that you have a driving force in upstream direction and so um, this is just to show uh, although you have here optical diagnostics, of course, it's very useful to combine that with other techniques uh, which are not accessible by optical diagnostics. And this is this pressure measurement. And when I run this movie, well, you find here uh, the instantaneous pressure and here the pressure trace. And uh, the aim was to come up, uh, as I said, with some indication that you have in the exhaust, uh, once the, uh, the uh, leading part of the flame has passed, a higher pressure. And with some imagination, you might find this uh, hypothesis validated. I'm not so sure if it's really true, because uh, those measurements are maybe not um, uh, accurate and precise enough. However, now it's already too late. You might have missed that. Um, now it's already in the, in the phase where you have these thermoacoustics and uh, very high pressure oscillations. So it's maybe not so important to repeat that. My, my point is, um, if you really want to understand what's going on in such a complicated process, you have to measure many parameters simultaneously, as accurate and as precise as possible. And especially here uh, in this configuration, pressure measurements through long, thin tubes, uh, which are guiding out the pressure variations to a sensor, which is maybe 30 centimeters away from the uh, actual flashback event, is, uh, is, is not so clear how to do that uh, um, properly. However, uh, maybe here is as well some information about the stability map I uh, mentioned earlier. As uh, what you can do is to, to drive the flame into flashback is um, to change the equivalence ratio, not the swirl in this case. And if you do so, for example, for isolines of Reynolds numbers, for low and higher Reynolds numbers, and you repeat the experiment and then just take the mean, and you find that uh, uh, with uh, increasing thermal power, meaning higher Reynolds number, uh, the flame is more uh, 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 resistant against flashback, as obvious from this graph. Yeah? And of course, something like that would be great to reproduce by numerical simulations. And that will be a tough task. Simply from the fact uh, that you have a lot of computations to be operated. It's a kind of stochastic experiment. These are hundreds of flashback events in the experiment. And uh, of course, uh, the physics is very rich. As I said, this is a special kind of flashback in the boundary layer. Yeah? And uh, you would have to resolve all of the heat losses, uh, all of the um, uh, boundary layer profiles thermally and from the velocity and from the flame uh, to uh, catch up all the physics correctly. <laughs> Maybe I switch now to the third example, unless you have questions. Yes, please. Well, the combustion instability comes later. When, when uh, the flame already passed and is anchored at the uh, swirl assembly. Because, uh, is there spinning mode which is associated with the spinning of the flame? Well, the spinning occurs even without having uh, the thermoacoustic oscillations. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's a good question. What is first? It's thermoacoustics causing flashback or flashback and then the thermoacoustics? From the time sequence we have seen from the pressure traces, I, I think uh, the, the uh, thermoacoustics is not the driving force in this case. I'm not saying that is always the case. Uh, what I'm saying in, in this case, I think it is. If you have an enclosed combustor and you have resonances in between, uh, the situation might be very different, and you uh, might see the flashback because of the thermoacoustics. Yes? Uh, when you use the laser sheet at an angle to the blood body uh, to deflect it, the reflections away from the camera? Yes. So, uh, is it in a closed chamber? Does there, are there multiple reflections inside the chamber? Well, maybe I can make a drawing here. Is that switch, switch on? Okay, here he comes. I make a cross section from the top. 
Yeah? This is blood body. Uh, this is the enclosure from Quartz. And then um, if you detect in this direction with your CMOS camera, um, and let's say this is the central axis, you send the laser beam like that. And then uh, the reflections go in this direction primarily. And uh, of course, there are as well reflections going possibly back into this camera system. But those are uh, already the second time reflected. That's something that can be taken care of. The, the, the problem only occurs if you have uh, two things. One is if you're out of the dynamic range of your camera, then you can't correct for it. And direct reflections might be uh, a problem in this regard. Or if your reflections are temporarily not stable. Otherwise, if they're within the dynamic range and stable, then you can subtract them. And that can be taken in the post-processing and you're fine. And that's why, in this case, uh, it is not a problem. If you would perform uh, uh, stereoscopic PIV and looking from two angles at it, then you can't do it in this simple uh, way. And that uh, caused always a lot of problems over here, uh, such that we couldn't measure close enough with the stereo PIV to the wall. There was another question? Reflections are temporarily unstable. They are not temporarily unstable in this case. They, they are stable. And that's why uh, uh, that's not a problem, uh, those reflections. However, if the, the, uh, as I said, if the, if the uh, too high, the reflections are over the range, the dynamic range, then you can't handle it, and then you can't subtract it anymore. Yeah. So what is the reason you are using uh, like oil seeding? Uh, the, yeah, the seeding, uh, using oil as a seeding in this case was as well to, to have a simple trace of the um, uh, flame front. Because not in all cases we were operating the OH lift simultaneously. But as well, we performed experiments with uh, non evaporating but uh, inert seeding and measured as well the velocity inside the flame, although it's not so interesting. Yeah. In, in the, in the uh, question we were asking. Yeah. Uh, all these burners, when they have this, uh, what do you call these unstable events that are happening? Yes. If you have a standard burner, can you repeat them? Well, that is a very good question. Of course, you can, because every, every event is different from the other. And you have to come up with, in the end, of course, with some statistics. Because uh, in turbulence, you cannot do anything without statistics. And my answer to that is uh, conditional statistics. And that is, uh, I didn't uh, discuss that, um, because that would take too much time. But um, I think here in this graph, what you've seen was always this line going with it. And this is one millimeter ahead. And by now taking, let's say, 20 flashback experiments and always measure the velocity profile a millimeter ahead of the flame tip as measured by uh, either evaporating droplets or by the OH, that way you get a conditional statistics. So the idea is, like as well in, in, in modeling of non premix flames in the flamelet model, for example, you're not as the observer in a, in a lab fixed coordinate system. But the idea is, in this kind of conditional uh, um, statistics, you're sitting as an observer at a certain uh, part of the flame. In this case, in very often the flame front, what you can somehow can measure. And then you're as an observer traveling with the flame and you look for the flow or other parameters just ahead of you. And thereby you can uh, average and make statistics as usual, but in a moving uh, coordinate system. And by that, uh, you're able to build up statistics that could be compared to simulations. Of course, sometimes as well, um, and I haven't talked about this here, um, flashback can, can, can happen in different modes. And I've shown only the most probable one. And you might classify beforehand. And this is always kind of fuzzy. Yeah? And depends on the information you have. Yeah? But that's needed. All right. More questions? Yes, please. That is yes. So uh, if you have a sheet in a fixed location, how are you capturing the entire? Yeah, you have uh, most of the events are at the wrong time at the wrong uh, the wrong uh, place. You have to wait for those, and we just store those where you have the flame tip in your in your uh, sheet. Yeah, and that's why uh, we always operate the system uh, in simultaneously with chemiluminescence imaging because from the chemiluminescence imaging we see the neighborhood, and from the neighborhood we decide. Okay or not okay, with a certain uh, flexibility. <laughs> okay, good question. <coughs> okay, the next level of complexity would be enclosed flames, um, where we built up um, 
the system already 15 years ago and hardly published anything. And the reason is, it is really difficult uh, to get something useful out and uh, controlling the boundary conditions and have all this complex system running, everything is in home build, simultaneously with uh, complex laser diagnostics that really needs uh, resistant PhD students. And uh, just uh, January next year, uh, another one in this field will uh, finish his thesis after six years uh, without any publication yet because he finished the measurements only in September. And I will come to a few examples later on. However, I still afford to have this combustor running because I think it's important to have the sequence from simple to complex. And the real complex thing is then, of course, more than we have, which is only a single nozzle combustor, uh, where we operated, for example, non-premixed flames in former days, nowadays it's premixed, or spray flames, and tried, of course, to mimic what really happens in a, in a real combustor. However, if you would go for an annular combustor under pressure, you have to go to the DLR in Cologne, for example, and you pay something like 150,000 euros per day just to operate the system, yeah, because of the electricity needed for the compressors. So um, that is maybe as well a good reason why we need numerical simulation. You can't afford to develop uh, at the uh, DLR at Cologne. Yeah? And uh, all the companies, Alstom, Siemens, uh, or Rolls-Royce, they, they go into the DLR Cologne, but already with, with uh, pre-tested systems and uh, try to cut down the test time at the rig as much as possible. And so this is now the intention to have something in between. The DLR is too costly and is not suited as well for validation purposes because uh, you have many things which are even more complicated to control. But on the other hand, to have two simple lab flames is not real as well. And so the idea is to have something in between. So you need a pressure housing. You need a flame tube that is optically accessible and that holds for long. Uh, you need a complex infrastructure because you need pressurized air for combustion and cooling. Um, we uh, preheat the combustion air electrically up to something like 750 Kelvin. Um, the fuel su supply must be pressurized. Uh, so that's why we have built up for natural gas a compressor, like a fuel station, yeah, that to tank your cars. We have that just to operate that rig, or a high pressure um, pump for liquids. And typically, we use here surrogate fuels, so not kerosene or something like that, because you have a huge amount of safety control things. If you use enheptane, a thousand liter enheptane tank, no one cares. But a thousand liter kerosene, oh, that is really very uh, uh, difficult to get allowance to do that. You need an exhaust gas treatment, especially cooling, and you need safety equipment uh, to make sure that your PhD student is not blowing up himself, <laughs> which is easy because you have a bomb. If you then ignite, then you might uh, have a, a problem. And so this actually is the combustor, and that's a small piece, something like that, and this is surrounded by large infrastructure, uh, preheating the combustion air, uh, having here the cooling air, having here the exhaust system where we uh, get rid of the uh, heat by evaporation enthalpy. We, we spray and water. We have a, a doubled house wall, uh, double, double walled um, uh, tube system such that this control valve is not getting more than 700K and then finally go to the chimney. So, uh, and the fuel comes somewhere in here. And so that was our formal design. Uh, where you see um, here this can combustor concept. Maybe I should, this is a cross section uh, in, in uh, flow direction and this is perpendicular to it. Uh, in former times we have decided for this ugly shape because uh, in that times we haven't been able to mesh with complicated unstructured meshes and so we thought try to be rotational symmetry as possible but this is of course not doable if you have plain windows. The idea is to have everything decoupled. So we have here the pressure windows, and they have been there for 15 years now. Nothing happened to them. Then we have uh, here inside the flame tube, we have here this green part, uh, those inner ones, maybe I should show it here. This is uh, a window taking the thermal load. Yeah? And this is not taking any pressure uh, and mechanical force. And that's uh, this intermediate window over here that is guiding the airflow. The cooling airflow you need to protect this window and the airflow is going in this direction. And then in former times, it was going directly into it. Uh, of course, that's nothing you like to do because uh, for uh, any computations, that is not, not a wise thing to do. I, I'll show you a improved setup in a, in a second. 
And then you have here uh, the preheated combustion air, and here is the nozzle, um, and uh, uh, the primary combustion zone is fully optically accessible. All right. Yeah, what should I say as well? Um, this ugly shape has been chosen as well because we were aiming for PDA measurements, that is to measure droplet sizes, nothing I'm talking about uh, uh, at this winter school. However, for that you need, uh, for the depending on the fuel, but something like 30 degrees between uh, laser in and detection, and that's why uh, this was inclined, but we gave up, that is not anymore the, the, the case. Do you have any idea why this is a bad design? Not only because of, let's say, the, the cooling air coming in here, if you would do any calculations, LES, RANS, whatever, of this type of combustor, you have any idea why this is bad? Well, the problem is you have no contraction nozzle shown here. And if you have no contraction nozzle, that means if you have, let's say, swirl created over here, uh, this, this angular momentum that stays forever. So you have to compute all the exhaust pipe. Forget it. Yeah? And uh, that is something that has to be uh, done differently, and uh, this lesson has been learned after some time. Uh, the improved setup comes in a second. So uh, here are some nozzles we were looking at. Uh, that's actually in a design from MTU. That's a German company uh, building um, gas turbines for helicopters, for example. I'm allowed to show because it's not used anymore, this kind of air blast nozzle. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, physics going on. You have here uh, a swirled combustion air as well here combustion air swirled, sometimes co world or uh, in different directions. And you have here uh, your liquid that is sprayed in an, uh, an angle, uh, like a cone, and it's hitting the wall, and it's building a film, and it's transported by shear forces to this edge over here. And then depending on the film thickness, you create here um, a spray, which is then, uh, of course, evaporating and dispersing into this uh, combustor. A very complicated um, system where all or many of the important things actually happen inside this nozzle. And we try to make that optically accessible, building that from quartz, and we failed. <laughs> it's, it's nearly, maybe it's possible, but, but uh, we have had an optical access from this side, and this part here, um, this uh, diffuser was made from quartz, and at least the idea was uh, to measure, is there at all times a film? Because I doubt that there is. And uh, uh, measuring the film directly would have been very complicated. What we've tried to measure was the surface temperature. If you have a surface temperature be below the boiling point, there will be a film. And if not, there's no film if it's above it. But we failed in the end. A more simple uh, nozzle that comes from a French company, Tobomeca, as well, um, building gas turbines, uh, especially for military uh, purposes. That is a, a design that has been smoothed by the people from the LES community. And um, the difference to a real one is that you have here uh, a, 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 no diffuser. Typically, you have uh, here a round edge. But the people from LES, some 10 years back, said, oh, we can't do it. And so um, we made a sharp edge over here and replaced the spray by simply a fuel jet and got a very nice system which is, I think, suitable for validation purposes because uh, it's a relatively simple and generic design in terms of the nozzle. And, um, but in this case, this is uh, a fixed swirl number of one. But as well, you can go for a flame sequence. You can change things. Uh, where here, the Reynolds numbers have been changed and accordingly the thermal power. Uh, and you see here the numbers are well above what we can achieve in uh, atmospheric conditions. So we are getting closer to reality. Well, here is the system under operation. Uh, of course, in this kind of system, you wouldn't, wouldn't like to have any thermoacoustics because I don't like them. That's one thing. But uh, it's, then, then, of course, I'm afraid that we damage things. And so um, getting and finding where the operation conditions are, that is always a kind of uh, yeah, well, uh, risk and danger until you know what to do to get it uh, operation safely. And here is uh, the spray flame uh, on this more complex nozzle. And you see this is taking, I think, with 10 kilohertz chemiluminescence. And uh, 10 kilohertz is not sufficient. Your eye wouldn't follow what's going on. Nothing is correlated over here. 10 kilohertz is much too slow to get any correlated values. You need, you need even faster diagnostics. But what you see as well is the flame is spinning. I think that can be seen some. And it sometimes moves upstream. 
And so there must be already mixing in the nozzle. And that is something which is extremely complicated uh, because you can't, as I said uh, uh, briefly, uh, you can't easily measure inside this nozzle. Okay, let's switch to what we're doing now. Of course, um, we learned our lessons uh, and did one um, major change. You see here now at the end of the flame tube a contraction. And by that contraction, um, you have a clear outlet boundary somewhere here, yeah, where you can be sure that there is no backflow. Yeah? And that, that was the problem with the, with the other design. And to, to make this happen, well, it's not easy if you have, let's say, under, under five bars, something like that, uh, something like, let's say, 150, 200 kilowatts, uh, the, the thermal load on this piece is, is really high. And, um, well, we, we have the facility to, to laser sinter these uh, metal materials with complex internal structures. And that was the solution in the end. We uh, provided uh, here excess for cooling water going inside into these wall structures. And this uh, in a complex design and uh, make sure that everything is cooled, even over many, many hours of operation without any damage. And then we use the cooling water coming out of the nozzle here that is then sprayed in the exhaust. And by evaporation, uh, we cool it, uh, the exhaust gases. On the left-hand side, you see again the plenum. And this is now designed for premixed operation. And this nozzle is, again, a very academic nozzle. This nozzle is like in the premixed swirl burner where we discussed the flash back previously, that is scaled down to be fitted into the system over here such that you can easily, during operation, change by a stepper motor the movable block and thereby the swirl number. And by that, you can now change the angle of the flame such that the flame hits the wall. And that's actually what I'm interested in. I want to better understand now, as a next level of complexity, actually what is going on in a real gas turbine combustor in terms of effusion cooling. So, of course, three walls are made from optical excess, from quartz, but the bottom wall, that is like in a real combustor, uh, made out of a plate with many, many holes, up to 500 holes, and the smallest 0.7 millimeters inclined by 30 degrees. Maybe I should make a, sh a short drawing again. Okay. If you look at this lower plate, um, then this is like that. You have here this effusion cooling holes, metal in between. And the flame comes down over here. And this is the region of interest. What is actually happening um, close to the wall when you have flame wall effusion cooling air interaction in terms of heat load, in terms of flow field, temperature field, and, of course, as well in terms of um, uh, pollutant emissions or pollutant generations like CO. And so for that, we designed here the system such that we can provide cooling air from this uh, wind tunnel, which is operated independently from the combustion air and from the cooling air of the windows, such that we have uh, an independent control of um, the mass flow rates and the temperature going into the uh, flame tube over there. And so. We um, can operate the system in two ways. Either you can operate it really as a lean premixed flame. You have, as in the example, atmospheric example, you have just this premixed, let's say, methane or natural gas air. But thereby you are limited in the operation range, and getting this uh, purely premixed flame stabilized, that is really tricky. And now I understand that gas turbine manufacturers, especially for, um, for uh, airplanes, will never do that like this because it's, it's, it's a pain to get uh, stable operation points. And it's much easier to bring in a small pilot. And so for that reason, now this bluff body is equipped with a small hole where you can eject fuel. You can stage between zero, pure premixed, up to 100%, purely pre uh, non-premixed. However, already if you have only 10% of the fuel going through the pilot, it is a very stable flame. Globally, you can get, go much leaner. And visually as well, although the same thermal power, uh, visually, the flame appears very different in the piloted case. And so that is actually what we uh, have looked at uh, in the last years with this poor PhD working for six years on it. And um, he performed, uh, it took quite some while to build up the system, uh, to get the system stably 
uh, operation conditions, reproducible, and so on. And I, I go not into all the details you have looked for to make this happen. And then he was um, so enthusiastic about it, and he wanted to perform a lot of different techniques to measure flow fields, the flame brush, uh, mixing fields of non-reacting cases, gas temperatures, and surface temperatures by phosphor thermometry. So I think all about these techniques I'm going to talk uh, in more detail later on. Um, I have uh, the intention is not here to explain how these techniques work that will follow. I will only share with you some, some recent results to get an idea about the quality uh, you can re receive from these um, diagnostics. What you see here after post-processing and after averaging is um, for the uh, piloted case and the non-piloted case a certain area. Uh, this is from zero is where you have the plane uh, where, the, where the nozzle is installed. And uh, you see here um, a field of view where actually the flame hits the wall. And what you see from this effusion cooling holes is uh, the mass stream coming out here and here. And uh, after uh, using tech plot, you can uh, come up with the streamlines to visualize what the flow looks like in mean. Of course, in instantaneously, that's completely different. You have a high turbulence level and a lot of uh, fluctuations going on. All right. If you now uh, use these thermographic phosphor um, imaging that we have developed, and I'm going to talk about details as well tomorrow, um, you can measure wall temperatures with a remarkable precision. Yeah? It's maybe not so accurate. It's, it's, its accurateness is, is defined over the calibration via thermal couples. However, you can be, uh, can be measured very, very precisely. And what you see as well now here is in the wake of these holes, you see uh, lower surface temperatures which are color coded here. It's only a couple of 10 degrees, however, that is um, making a difference. And do you have an idea why it's inclined? It's a swirl. It's a swirl. It's ex ex uh, ex expected. <laughs> OK, as you see as well, inside the holes, we have as well some temperature information, but it's not yet masked out because it directly comes out of the lab. OK, do you have any questions to that part? Then maybe I'll switch over to optically accessible IC engines. That is something we started only, I think, six years ago um, because um, I was asked very often about data that we have measured with, with industrial partners uh, in, in Germany. But uh, we had the data, but we never had the catch drawings. Yeah? And uh, these companies never say no, but they ne never give the, the geometry. And so um, the data were useful for the companies, uh, but my corporation partners um, uh, asking for this data, and I think as well unique data, uh, they couldn't use it for their purposes in numerical simulations because we haven't access to these geometrical details. And that's why we built up our own engine. And the idea was, um, well, we do have great diagnostics, and um, others will have maybe in five years later. And so we decided to buy an engine. So the optical engine is actually um, can be bought from different companies, and we decided for AVL for different reasons, and uh, built up uh, around this engine an infrastructure, again, following the idea to control the boundary conditions. Yeah, that you will see in a second. OK, so of course, if you look into IC engine combustion, it's very different to gas turbine combustion, um, where you have statistically stationary conditions. And in principle, can use something like a jet flame as a canonical counterpart for a gas turbine. Yeah? Because many things already in a jet flame or a post-jet flame happen in reality in this gas turbine combustor. That is different in IC engine. To my opinion, there is no canonical configuration where you can study IC engine combustion uh, unless you, you have to directly to go into the real complicated geometry. Yeah? And that is, uh, yeah, that's a fact. And uh, that makes things very, very difficult. OK, so here's a view graph or a photo of our uh, single cylinder research engine. And maybe to give some idea, First of all, you see here four cameras. By that time, we have measured tomographically PIV, the velocity field. Um, the cylinder head over here that is from production type. That is a company called Opel that belongs to GM, that is uh, producing uh, cars for Europe. Um, you see here the exhaust pipe system, the intake system. And in a, in a sketch, uh, you will more clearly see that. They are straight tubes. Of course, no one would build an engine in the car like that. 
uh, because of uh, space restrictions. However, we do that because we want to uh, guarantee uh, well-defined inflow boundary conditions to the engine. Then we see here the cylinder uh, to a portion of 55 millimeters is optically transparent. And as well, um, the uh, case is here open. Maybe that's difficult to see. There's a mirror. And the piston as well is, is uh, made from quartz, uh, the central part, such that you can look over the mirror uh, from underneath onto the cylinder head. Yeah, that's quite uh, normal. We have decided for a flat piston. However, when we perform experiments with industrial partners, they have typically then curved uh, um, uh, piston surfaces because that, of course, has some significance <coughs> for stabilizing tumble motions. So here is a sketch of the system. That's the engine. And this is the intake, very long, the exit, exhaust. And all of them are, um, let's say, starting or ending with large volumes, where we measure, of course, pressure and temperature. And for any simulation, that ideally would be the, uh, the boundary conditions between here and here. But very often, depending on the uh, people doing the numerical simulation, they, they start uh, sometimes only here. And that, of course, is a problem. But uh, when they use, for example, um, uh, orthogonal grids yeah, and immerse boundary conditions, uh, they cannot afford to, to take everything into account. And that's why they start uh, maybe too late. And um, it's very difficult then to compare uh, results from numerical simulations from these different groups. And by the way, uh, we have a so we, we called it a Darmstadt engine workshop. We have now, I think, next year, the sixth time, uh, people worldwide using the data, uh, doing simulations on this engine, and uh, comparing those, um, because I think there's a huge need to do that. Well, it's a half liter engine, bore and stroke 86 millimeters, compression ratio 8.5. Wow, not very good. Uh, of course, typically this should be in reality much higher, but that is because of the fact that you have um, with a piston, maybe we can switch that on again, uh, if you have here the piston, and then typically you have the piston rings here, however, in an optical engine, you have them somewhere here, because you want to avoid, if this is made from quartz, um, and here's the cylinder head, you want to avoid uh, that uh, they scratch over the metal quartz part. And that's why um, the crevices are huge. Crevices in IC engines, optically accessible IC engines, depending on the height, the optical height that, that is accessible, are large. In our case, that is, uh, I forgot it, maybe six cubic centimeters or whatever. And that means as well, the combustion looks, if you look for the pressure trace, for example, the pressure trace looks quite ugly in the end phase of combustion. Uh, if you have here the time or crank angle, and let's say here you've top dead center, um, and you have something like, like this, then very often you have a, uh, an, an ugly phase of combustion over here, because outgassing from the crevices uh, make it look very, very strange. And so by that, simply by this fact, it's clear that an optical engine is rather good if you want to understand what's going on in terms of the flow field. The early stage of combustion as well. The late stage of combustion, you have to be careful. When the flame touches the wall, different heat transfer, this different uh, outgassing here from the crevices and so on uh, will impact what you're interested in if you're looking for this late phase. It's still useful, but I say it's quite different from reality. It's still useful in terms of comparing it to simulations, but still, then you need to know everything what's going on in, in, these, in these parts, where uh, in, the, in the past, at least, people have not really cared about. All right. Well, we are as well restricted in terms of rounds per minute. Uh, only by installation, we have operated it with a PMI of 10 bar and 3,000 rounds per minute. And that was frightening with an engine uh, made of quartz. And so uh, you better keep outside the room. And uh, we are able here uh, to, to change the manifold pressure um, uh, for uh, uh, turbocharge or mimicking turbocharging. And seeding can be done. Typically, people use oil for obvious reasons, because you want to avoid any particles. Uh, because uh, you know, if you have moving components, that would be not a good idea. However, if you use bore nitride, that's, that's performing well. That's, uh, that is not a problem. And so we have performed as well 
uh, with the Bohr nitride particles um, with solid seeding successfully PIV measurements. Okay, if you look into what the engine developers are after, of course, there, there's a conflict of interest between power emissions and efficiency, and uh, quite clearly, uh, that is all of that is influenced by combustion. And again, you have to measure as much as possible from the flow field over the mixture preparation about uh, ignition, early flame propagation, and then in the end, flame wall interaction. Okay, very interlinked processes, and I'll give you here some ideas about what has been done in the past. So, first of all, uh, particle image velocimetry, as I said, I will explain in detail later, uh, can be performed either using the seeding oil or solid particles, where you, for example, shine in the laser over this mirror through this piston, and in this case it was with an uh, industrial partner where we have had a, a, a shaped uh, surface, and uh, to compensate for the optical effects over here, there is a lens underneath, it's as well, uh, used by different um, groups. And uh, we were able then uh, to measure uh, in, in the uh, intake stroke, the compression stroke, of course we can measure over the whole cycle in principle, but here it was especially the flow spray interaction that we were interested in. And uh, yeah, well, it's challenging because you have a lot of surfaces and scattering is a problem. And here's maybe a side note for those uh, who are planning to do PIV. If you, if you are going to buy a PIV laser, it's not all about energy. Well, these experiments have been uh, conducted with only, I think, 500 microjoule per pulse in the green. Yeah? But this was a laser with a well-behaved beam profile. The m square of this uh, was in the order, this is a, a beam quality factor, you can say, was in the order of two or three. And thereby, if you focus it, you have had the photons at, in, the, in the sheet where you want it. If you have an m square maybe of 20 or something like that, you cannot focus that laser and then you have a lot of photons in the wings of your sheet, and they give rise to uh, surface scattering, which, which is really a problem. Well, um, you need uh, suitable seeding particles, which is especially when you go for um, a combustion, not, not, not easy. Bohr nitride is doing that, we know that well. And you need an optimized uh, interval between the two sheets, uh, the, the two pulses. You will see that later how PIV works, but for those who know, of course, uh, the dynamic range of PIV tem temporally in the sense of the velocity range is very, very limited. And that's why um, it's difficult in IC engine combustion if you go over the whole cycle with high speed where you measure every crank angle because every crank angle, uh, the mean velocity changes. And some at, at the early stage, let's say during intake, you have an intake jet that is maybe 80 meters per second and then late in the, or in the in top dead center beginning for compression you might have typical values in the order of five meters per second. And that's why it is good to have, let's say, the interval between these two shots from the PIV should be changing accordingly with the engine time. Yeah? This is a, you need to, to uh, construct for that and you need a laser that is performing with this. And then, uh, maybe already here, what PIV is, it's very easy. You take two exposures that are separated a couple of microseconds and already by eye, you can follow these particles. This is scattering from the particles. And all you need is a mathematical algorithm translating that into velocity vectors that is done by cross-correlation, and you end up with this. And that can be now, and this is uh, the real uh, innovative thing about uh, taking these new lasers. You can, with the crank angle resolution now, follow individual cycles. And you can do that over hundreds of cycles. They're depending, just limited by the onboard memory of a camera. And let's uh, do that here. That is not our engine. Our engine wouldn't have here this uh, black area in between. In our engine at Darmstadt, we have the full excess. But in our industrial partners engine, they have here a ceiling in between. That's why you have no vectors here. Um, the intake valves would be here. The exhaust valves would be over here. This is a direct injection stratified engine. There's only one company worldwide in production using that for part load operation. So the this is an outwards opening piezo driven uh, injector um, that gives rise uh, or that can be operated many times per cycle uh, to optimize combustion performance and then you have here uh, the spark plug and one of the primary interests of, of uh, engine designs nowadays in auto engines uh, using stratification is to reduce cyclic variations and that actually was one step into an understanding what's going on when i go through here 
you see now the compression stroke, uh, crank angle by crank angle, or maybe every second crank angle shown here. And color coded is the velocity. You nicely see the tumble center. So these engines are designed in a way that you have a, a large vertex, vertex inside the uh, cylinder uh, that, that has been created by the intake uh, flow, creating this uh, uh, tumble with a tumble center somewhere here. Of course, moving uh, simply because the piston moves. Yeah, of course, it's nothing is statistically stationary over here. And when I go further, now you see in a second the piston coming into the field of view. Somewhere here, that is now the piston, the curved piston. And now the first injection comes. There's a part load operation. You bring in the spray, the fuel, very late. Uh, here's the spray. Well, this is a an, an, an cone angle injector. What you see here is an artifact from multiple scattering. So if you go with a laser through a cone, you would expect something like two, uh, two branches. But what you see here is something in between. That is artifact. This is not true. This is a multiple scattering and uh, uh, can be avoided uh, by structural illumination, for example, but this was not the scope. The scope was to look for the spray-induced turbulence. And here you see, for example, you, if, you, if you spray in a cone like this, of course, you create a, a, a tumble, a, a vertex, a closed vertex ring inside and outside of the spray, and you cut now with the laser through. This is the, what you see then in the PAV. Uh, this is the leftover of, of this uh, vertex that has been created by the spray. And you see uh, the length scale of this vertex is significant. So that stays for quite some while, and that is the problem. Because now you will have the second injection, and uh, it will now interact with the spray-induced turbulence of the previous injection, and that changes from cycle to cycle. Those injectors are just perfect. If you would operate them in a, in, a, in a combustion bomb, one spray would be like the other. It is really uh, here because of the uh, flow field, which is now interacting with the sprays, such that the second spray does show a certain intermittency from cycle to cycle, and thereby changes as well uh, the um, uh, local equivalence ratio, and thereby as well the ignition. Yeah? So that shows, well, these kind of investigations can be done easily by an optical engine because uh, these crevices and so on are not a, not a problem. Yes? What the fuel? Uh, the fuel, I think here, that was, um, uh, that was not pure gasoline. I think it was a gasoline uh, with some replacements, but I forgot. It's a, it's a research gasoline. Yeah? It's, it's, it's very close to gasoline. Some components have been removed. Because industrial partners typically do not like to operate with iso-octane. Yeah, they want to have a, a fuel which is, which is uh, but, but I think we have reduced aromats over here, but I have to look that up. Yeah. In an optical unit, how do you ensure that your uh, dating particles or the fluid is not sticking to your optical unit? That's a very good question. Actually, in the engine, um, it was never a problem. It was never a problem uh, like in the gas turbine combustor. In the gas turbine combustor, you have to operate, if you do PIV, uh, with kilohertz uh, as much as possible, not because you want to get the temporal sequence, uh, but you have only a couple of seconds until it's completely covered. And uh, uh, getting access to the gas turbine combustor means you have to cool it down, you have to destall this, you have to clean it, and this takes one hour or something like that. In the optical engine, uh, we, depending on the operation conditions, uh, you can uh, especially when you do it with oil and motored uh, uh, conditions, not fired, you can operate the system one hour if you wish. So, no, no, with the oil, I think uh, that's that not the problem because uh, that's, of course, as well evaporating. If you use solid seeding like boron nitride, which, by the way, is a lubricant, and that's why it's uh, working as well in this engine, um, then, then eventually you have to clean uh, maybe pff, how many runs they have taken not sure anymore, but, but then you have eventually to clean it uh, and uh, do that multiple times per day for sure. But uh, you have a couple of, uh, maybe maybe two minutes of operation until you have to do it. Yeah, yeah. But, but that is much easier because uh, 
The cylinder head is only uh, clamped by four bolts, and then there is a crane, and you can just lift it, and then it's done within, I, I think after some training, they can do it within 10 minutes or something like that. Yeah. They are sent along with the air. Yes, they they go. Um, we have different kinds of seeding for um, um, seeding generators, but they are injected in the intake air, something like one and a half meters uh, upstream the intake valves. Yeah, <laughs> it's always a good question. Is, is seeding particles are changing the combustion? Um, if you overseed at a certain stage, yes, for sure. Um, however, too much seeding you have to avoid as well because of, of uh, uh, reasons based on the diagnostics. Um, it's hard to answer. Um, maybe it's difficult to answer that for the engine. That take me it, it, it differently. When you go back to the opposed jet flame, where you have very sensitive uh, the extinction limit, uh, very sensitive to any boundary conditions or changes. And there we have to make sure that by adding seeding that the extinction limits have not been changed by more than 2%. But the, you see a difference. Yeah? And, and for that, th there is an influence, but it's extremely difficult to quantify. Yeah? And it depends on the question you're asking. Okay. Forming larger droplets. If you if you take if you take aerosol um, oil, I think that is not a problem. We never observed that. If you look at the uh, me scattering images, they are very homogeneous. If you use solid seeding, uh, agglomerates are a huge problem. And so this is something like a black art, and everyone, uh, even every PhD in my group, do, does it differently because uh, the tradition sometimes they think is not good enough for what they achieve. So uh, depending on the seeding material. You have to dry it. Uh, then uh, we put it typically in a in a fluidized bed and uh, operate that such that uh, everything is, is is lifted and go. Then to to destroy these agglomerates, we go through a critical nozzle where you have strong acceleration, eventually breaking up the clusters or the agglomerates. But still, if you look at the me scattering images, you always find uh, a larger variation in intensity compared to oil seeding which are due to these uh, different sizes. And so we cannot completely avoid that. And I think as well, that is something uh, giving rise to inaccuracy. This is causing a bias. And that is very, very difficult um, to quantify. Thank you. The turbulence intensity depends again on where you're looking at. If you're looking, for example, at the intake jet, uh, it doesn't matter. If you're looking for uh, the temporal development of the tumble, it has a huge impact. In this engine where we have, uh, in this case, where we have this um, uh, curved surface, the tumble is anchored and it's much more stable from cycle to cycle compared to a flat piston. Yeah? About the turbulence intensity, yes, uh, because uh, the location of the tumble, uh, no, let's take it differently. What is turbulence in an engine? It's, it's hard to tell. Of course, you're thinking in a, in a Reynolds uh, decomposition uh, way, right? But that is not completely true in the tumble uh, engine because you have, you have, of course, an average flow. You have a variation because of the tumble location, and you have real turbulence. Yeah? And so I, I'm afraid I, can, I cannot really answer your question. Yeah, uh, the and yes, the yes, yes, oh, for sure. Because uh, the location of the large vertex does impact how, how uh, the spray is, is uh, let's say, disturbed, and uh, by that as well, evaporation is, is changed. Yeah? There's a good reason that in production engines you have this curved su surface. No one would do it without that. Yeah? Yes? Yeah, as, as well, a very good question. The, uh, if you have very, a lot of uh, Scattering particles from the spray, that was the question. Of course, as you have seen here, uh, the camera is saturated. And you have to take the right high-speed camera. The first camera we were using, I don't know if you know about CMOS cameras, but CMOS cameras should be such that they, as no, um, there is no um, uh, uh, crosstalk between pixels. Let's take it this word, yeah? which is called blooming in C CCDs. Um, 
that some of the CMOS cameras do not behave like that. I never understood that. Uh, there is a crosstalk and, and uh, blooming maybe over, over mass. I don't know where it comes from. It depends on the camera. Because um, in this type, here we have used a different camera, and there was actually no crosstalk. And some pixels, as you see, were completely saturated, but the others were not influenced by that. And so that, that is uh, number one. The second is, of course, in the close vicinity of that, you will uh, not get meaningful vector sound. So you have to have a certain distance from them where you can make use of them. But later in the cycle, after that, you see when the spray is gone, you still see what's going on. And that is the primary interest. Measuring really uh, the shear layer, the shear turbulence between the spray and the fluid is maybe with this technique not possible. OK. I'm not sure. Game is over. Yeah, time is over. Uh, then I maybe close just very briefly to, to say you can do more than two component PAV. Uh, maybe as well interesting for the people doing numerical simulation that you can think as well of ways how to compare now uh, velocity, experimental velocity data to simulation. Because you have, if you do it tomographically, and this is shown here, if you tomographically means you do the same like in two component PAV, the only difference is you perform it in a thicker sheet. Let's take eight millimeters, that's the maximum at least we achieve. And then you use more than one camera, you use maybe four cameras, and you make a volumetric reconstruction, how the particles move in volume, not in your, in, not in your plane. And by that, you can get access to very interesting uh, information about, here's, for example, during the intake stroke, uh, the velocity, the velocity magnitude in, in a volume taken from all three components. But maybe more interesting is you have access to the vorticity and strain rate tensor, to the full uh, vorticity and strain rate tensor, and thereby, for example, you can deduce as well, if you take, let's say, this criterion from Hund, published in 1988, this uh, Q criterion, no details here, you can visualize uh, turbulent structures. And thereby, you can very nicely see as well, dependent on where you are in your compression or expansion stroke, whatever you're looking at, you can look into how these turbulent structures are in their geometry in, in, in time and space. And that is something I find very interesting, how turbulent structure is changing during the engine cycle. And we just submitted a paper about that. Uh, you can classify this in a Lumley triangle to see whether you are isotropic or not. And in most times, turbulence in the engine is not isotropic. So forget any Renz models. They are physically <coughs> wrong. Yeah? You, have to do, uh, you have to account for this anisotropy somehow in your models. But if you look into industrial prox uh, practice, no one cares. They do everything with a simple uh, uh, two equation closure in this uh, Renz context. And with that, I think I would like to close the session for today and thank you for your kind attention.